All right, so I'll just start with a quick quick intro just to get started. By, you know, by 4 o'clock, I should be done with that, and we can get to work here. So my name is Paul Robinson um, from Rochester. I know we have some Rochester folks in here. I've uh, had the honor and privilege of being in the cybersecurity community in Rochester for 14 years this coming October. Uh, I'm also aware of this presentation that I have three strikes against me. Uh, so strike one was, I told a few of you, my daughter's junior prom was last night, and she decided to enter shenanigans at 3.30 in the morning. Um, and I was at Richard's house to pick him up at 6, which was about a 20 minute drive, so probably about an hour and a half of sleep. Probably won't remember a damn thing that I'm saying here today. Um, so that's strike one. Strike two is that it is a sunny day in Buffalo, and it's warm out and you've been here all day. So that's strike two. Uh, strike three against me at this point is um, I'm talking about something that is not that technical and I'm up against a very popular talk right now um, that a lot of people said that they were going to um, and that they didn't want to hear what I had to say. So that's fine, that's cool, <laughs> I'm down with that. I, I get it, I get it, it it's, it's all good. So, um, so again, I've, I've had the privilege of being in cybersecurity for 14 years, and uh, about five years ago, I, I came up with the idea that we have a fundamental problem in our industry. And uh, you know, this could be interactive. You know, you can agree, disagree, whatever. But the fundamental problem that we have is that we have a tendency as companies and organizations to throw tools at problems without thinking it through. I'll pause there after making that statement and see nods of heads or shaking no or things like that. Um, but it's, it's a problem because we, we chase the blinky shiny lights when it comes to cybersecurity. We get the $70,000 Gartner report, we go top right, and we're like, okay, I'm gonna buy that. But I'm a 250 employee manufacturing organization and I just bought a tool that takes two FTE to run, but I only have one person in my security department. The math just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And it didn't work for me when, when I was thinking it through. So about six months ago, um, again, I'm from Rochester, originally from Brooklyn, so there's a lot of crazy in me. I said, all right, there are two things that I have an opportunity to do here. It's either A, do I try something really wild and crazy, now without having regret 10 years from now that I didn't do it? Or do I just kind of stay in the background and kind of go along with the crowd of what it is that I'm going to do? So I went crazy. And so six weeks ago, I started my own cybersecurity consulting firm, independent. It's just me. Uh, I'm not a bar. I'm not a systems integrator. I'm not plugging in firewalls. I'm not doing anything. But I really see this being a problem for organizations and leaving them extremely vulnerable by not having a plan for the tools that they have. So I wanted to take some time today. I got this to about 35, 40 minutes. Hopefully it stays around there to get you out a couple of minutes early and enjoy the day. But it, it talks about our programs and our tools centered around cybersecurity risk. So if you build it, they will come. Anybody remember what movie that's from? Field of the Dreams. Okay, good. okay. all right, good, good. Yeah, yeah, it's from Field of Dreams. And, um, <clears throat> What we want to do here is unpack building a cybersecurity program for your organization and having the program automated by tools. And I'll get into that slide in a little bit. So I'm going to go a little bit backwards here. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk about some things that I've seen major organizations with successful cybersecurity programs do to start to build that program. But I want to build the case for it first. So, like I said, the program automates the tool. It says, ask Jerry. So, we're going to let Seinfeld talk to us about automating the tool. Elaine? Oh, hi. Welcome back. How was 
the show. Great, I had fun. Where's the TV? Where's the VCR? What? They were stolen. Stolen? When? A couple of hours ago. The police are coming right over. Stolen? Someone left the door open. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you left the door open? Oh, uh, Jim, you know, I, I was cooking and I, I, you know, I came in to get the spatula. I left the door open because I was going to bring the spatula right back. Wait, you left the lock open or the door open? The door. <laughs> the door? You left the door open? Yeah, well, I was going to bring the spatula right back. Yeah, and? Well, I got caught up watching a soap opera. <laughs> Old and the Beautiful. <laughs> so the door was wide open? Wide open. <laughs> Where were you? I was at Bloomingdale's, waiting for the shower to heat up. <laughs> Look, Jerry, I'm sorry. I'm. You have insurance, right, buddy? No. <laughs> How can you not have insurance? Because I spent my money on the Clapco D29. It's the most impenetrable lock on the market today. It has only one design flaw. The door <laughs> must be closed! <laughs> So after the 13th time watching that episode, um, I came up with a correlation to our industry. And um, it's, it's a really interesting kind of metaphor into cybersecurity. So Jerry spent all this money on the Klepto X29 lock, but something as simple as Kramer coming in and leaving the door open, it didn't matter because the door was unlocked. Robert came in, cleaned them out, it's a whole other mess of, of, of an episode. Great episode if you catch it, watch the whole thing through. But that kind of goes into what I'm talking about, having the program autom being automated by the tool. So if Jerry had taken time to sit there and talk with Elaine and talk with Kramer and talk with George and say, hey, I just spent a ton of money on this expensive lock that's impenetrable. All you have to do is just make sure you shut the door and lock it that's kind of the program of how to use that lock. So he didn't talk about it. He just assumed, hey, the lock is there, and we're going to be fine. And, that, and we, we see that so many times in, in our industry. I had an organization that called me up on a Friday at 4 o'clock, and the guy was upset because he got Ryut, um, blew up the backups, encrypted uh, fraud, complete mess. But he was angry because he bought a tool that, I won't mention the name, but they're in the car racing these days, and they have a very high uh, stock price. Won't mention anything. But, um, but he said, but they said they stopped breaches. And they gave me a million dollar guarantee that nothing would come through here. I don't understand what happened. And so when the forensics took place and everything took place, we looked at the configurations that, that they did for the, for the tool. They forgot one important thing. They forgot one configuration, and that was all the intruder needed to get in, destroy the business, and, and cause a whole mess. Another thing, I used to have a running joke. I used to work for a company that did IR, and we would have a side bet on any IR that came in, what would be the chances of them being an O365 shop without having multi-factor authentication on it. And we were like, okay, the, per the, the organization that had it on and he still got hit, we're going to buy each other a steak dinner. We never bought a steak dinner. It was always the case. O365, you're spending money on all these licenses, but you don't have multi-factor authentication on it. As three buckets, there's another one. Equifax, one of the biggest ones that were out there. As three buckets, wide open, without, without multi-factor authentication. So how do we enforce this? Well, we make it part of our security culture, and security culture is something that we're lacking these days, where people understand the risk that's involved without executing on our tools properly. So building a policy and procedure and saying anything that touches our network that's connected that we can password protect, we're going to add multi-factor authentication to it, just because here's what happens if we don't. Or if we buy a new security tool for our environment, we're going to either get professional services for it, or we're going to make sure that every I is dotted, every T is crossed to make sure that the tool that we have purchased 
is going to be to just make sure that we are protected and that we're in good shape. The next piece of it is that the program needs to be understood. Understood. So ask Garcia. So how many of you are familiar with this when you're trying to articulate cybersecurity to the business? Whoa! Welcome to the 21st century. Yay, technology. Behold, everyone has a new tablet. You've gone paperless? You're not doctor of the dark ages. I went old school for your anti-technology quirk, paper files, hard copy photos, but the uh, abacus is your responsibility. Garcia, not that I don't appreciate your efforts, but exactly where did the funding for these come from? I did a thing. A thing? Let's not talk about the thing. We'll talk about the thing later. <laughs> so, this is the beauty of these sides, in my opinion. You guys and ladies are the best and the brightest minds in Western New York when it comes to cybersecurity. Brilliant. It's intimidating standing up here. As you can tell how Rowan and, and Kelsey helped me to fix this out, not exactly on par with you guys from the technology perspective and the knowledge that you have. It's the same thing with your organizations. Um, they're not the best and the brightest and the smartest, and you kind of have to break it down into layman's terms to get them to understand how you're trying to execute on a cybersecurity program. Security is an emotional thing. There's a lot of emotion that's tied into it. I've had CISOs cry on my shoulder. I am from Brooklyn. I do not do emotions. So to have a grown man weep on my shoulders and drape his arms over me, six foot four, six foot five, um, was horrific. <laughs> Love the guy, like we're best we're best buds now, but it was it was horrific. But he was he was scared because he's like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm just terrified that I'm gonna go to jail and, and everything like that. But going back to that story, he had tried to articulate to the organization the need for an incident response plan. And he was just saying, guys, we just need to have a plan in place and something in case something happens. And they bucked it and they bucked it and bucked it. Six months later, I get a call from him at 4 a.m., we're hard down. Like, we're hard down, we're losing money left and right, um, and we're in trouble. So what we want our programs to be able to do is to be understood by corporate and understand the severity of what a cyber attack should, that could happen, what could happen in a cyber attack. I did a pen test presentation at a um, assisted living facility and 82% of the nurses credential into a phishing attempt that we did. Uh, and I was in charge of giving the presentation as to you know the results and what happened. So the nurses are sitting there, chief medical doctors are sitting there, HR is sitting there, and they're all laughing. They thought it was fine. They're like, oh, I guess we're stupid. And I guess, oh, I guess we're not technology sound. And I paused and I said, you do realize you can kill patients like this. And like a hush came over me. People give me dirty looks, and they're like, well, what are you talking about? I'm like, yes. I'm like, Mr. Smith on, on the fifth floor takes diabetic medication, five milligrams of pill. Criminals are trying to cause harm to people that you're dealing with. So let's say they add two zeros to the script because they got into the network due to your negligence, and you give Mr. Smith 500 milligrams of the pill, and he's killed. That's real stuff. And it started to click. It started to get in their brains, oh my goodness. This is something that we need to, to keep an eye on. Um, I did a presentation at a school district. Town board was there, and they clearly needed to do some things to shore up their security defenses. And again, I'm from Brooklyn, so I'm kind of, you know, I got guts. We'll, we'll leave it G because this is being recorded. I got guts. And the superintendent's like, well, we can't afford it, and, and, and we, we can't do anything with the student data. We'll just try our best and whatever. I said, okay you could have a child killed because of a cyber attack. She's like, what are you talking about? She's like, who, who are you to say that? I'm like, okay, let's do the scenario. Database, I said, do you have health, health records in your database here for the student nurse? Yes. I said, okay. Do you have children that have antidepressant medication or medication for mental health? She says, absolutely. I said, okay. Let's say a student breaks into the student, to the student records and they find out that the captain of the cheerleading team is, is on antidepressants and mental health drugs. 
and they decided to be a jerk about it, and they put out on Facebook that this child is on mental health drugs. I have, I have children that work for mental health, and I would be scared to know how they reacted to that. It could be catastrophic. It could be termination. It's that serious. And so it started to click. So when we're building our programs, we need to make sure that the business understands what it is that we're trying to protect. Not, again, you, you're all geniuses here, so you can get up here and you can talk about cryptography, you can talk about PENDA, 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 you can talk about the OSI model, you can talk about OSINT, you can talk about all this stuff, and it's just gonna go over their head because they can't comprehend that. But what you wanna do is give a real life scenario of what happened here. Anybody remember the payroll attack that took place about a couple of years ago from the payroll company? The so payroll company got hit um, and people went without paychecks all of December. So Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, New Year's, anything else that's celebrated costs money. Presents, gifts, expensive meals, trips. You have no access to that money. So that's the type of way that you have to be when you talk with your with your folks, is to say, listen, can we afford to have this happen? No, absolutely I don't have that. That's why we need a program put in place, and then once the program is established, then we can talk about the tools. The program is about the money. The program is about the money. Ask Kevin. I'm not going to play the video because it's annoying. Um, he's my least favorite character on Shark Tank. But anyway, Kevin O'Leary goes on and says money for about 30, he says it 34 times and I think two minutes or something like that, just about how he talks about money. And really, this is all an exercise in money preservation for organizations. So I'll ask a question. Let's say a magic wand was waved and there was no more monetary value of PII. You think we'd all have jobs? Um, well, there, there are other information assets. There are, the there are, there are, there are. But would you say that that would eradicate a lot of problems that we have if we took the dollar amount away from the data? I'd have to be satisfied that the reason there are legal protections for certain PII, especially I'm thinking minor students, K-12 students, is more than its monetary value, but in the U.S. I really could be wrong. <laughs> no, David's one of my best friends in the industry, by the way. So yeah. I knew he'd say something. He's always good for that, so I appreciate you bringing that. Yes, I do stop off, and I love it. I think it's We need more Davids. But um, would it eradicate it? Probably not eradicate it 100%. But if you told the criminals, and you know, that we're looking to gain um, finances by taking PII, stealing it, selling it on the dark web, monetizing all like that, like we would, we would have problems. This, this is another thing that you should build the program. Now I'm gonna go to the executive and board level piece of it. So I kind of talked about the business piece of it, but the executive and board level piece of it. So Kevin is CEO, he sits on boards and whatever, and all he knows about is money. Like that's all he cares about is money. And that's really all the executives and, and the boards care about is money. And how are we protecting money for ourselves? I'll give you a story. Um, there was an organization in Seattle that I did an incident with. I, uh, you know how you get the flyers for Tops and for M&T Bank, and they come in the mail and all like that. They, they're one of the leading providers of that. And they got hit, and they were brought to a screeching halt for 32 days. Couldn't produce anything. And. Um, it was very interesting because they were ISO compliant, SOC 2 attested, PCI, HIPAA, high trust because of all the information that they were gathering from their, from their vendors. And their three top vendors that they had all came back to them and they said, okay, you did the forensics report and it's going through, it's, it's showing us that it, this came through a password that um, that was being that was able to be cracked. This doesn't line up with the policies and procedures of the things that you attest to. We want to review your all of your policies and procedures. And they reviewed them and they said, "How did you get a how did you pass your ISO audit? How did you get SOC to attest it? For this is garbage. This is absolute garbage." And they're like, "Well, 
there was this company in another country, I won't mention the country, there was this company in another country and they said for $5,000 they could get a SOC 2 tested, ISO audited, high trust certified, and we didn't have enough money to spend, and we just did like that. I'm like, okay, great. Here's what's gonna happen. All three companies left them. 20% workforce reduction because they could not afford to pay for employees for the organization because of all this lost revenue that, that happened and it took place. And oh, by the way, they were losing up to $168,000 a day for non-production. Multiply that times 38. Money is very important in the programs that we built. So when we're articulating to our executives, when we're articulating to the boards, and we go up with the Nessus report, with the heat maps, and the 10 dots, and the 255 dots, and all this technical jargon, it goes over their head. And I've heard some security people say, oh, my board's stupid, my executive team's up. No, they're not stupid. You don't get to that point by being stupid. You get to that point because you know how to make money and you know how to generate revenue. So I have a million dollar idea that if one of you steal it, please just like send me and my family to an all-inclusive. That's all I ask is, you know, I'm not looking to do whatever. And one of you guys will be, or gals will be smart enough to put this together. But we need to come up with like a babble for cybersecurity. We need to come up with a babble. You know what babble like is? Tower? Huh? No, you mean no, like a, 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 a language it's, translator. We need a language, it, it, so it's an application that oh, does. Oh, Babelfish. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So we need to have the ability as technical people to have the ability to talk to all facets of our organization. So, you know, when, again, being smart, having our CSSPs, having our CISAs, great stuff. But if we can't take that information and break it down for them, then we're in trouble. Like, I took this presentation through my wife. My wife is awesome, she's great, she's smart. She's not a security person. I had to make sure that this presentation was understandable for her to say, okay, it's simple enough to where you all can take some of this information back to your executive teams and have the ability to kind of convey some of the things that you've learned here today. An example that I always give is, you know, I think of a car dealership. And, you know, car dealerships, now the FTC rule is coming out. Yeah, they're taking a little bit more seriously, but, you know, whatever. Go to a salesperson at a car dealership and tell them that they have to put multi-factor authentication on the iPad that they have um, and, and watch, watch MFs fly all over the place. You're going to slow me down. I'm just trying to sell cars here. I'm not a security person. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Salesperson, let me ask you something. Let's say you have a list of 100 clients that you're supposed to call back this month that are looking for cars to buy, and your biggest competitor steals that data. What happens to you? I lose my job. Absolutely. So that's why we're putting this in place for you, to make sure that you are preserved, your checks are preserved. Your checks preserved means that your family eats. Your family eats means that they're happy. Happiness at home is a very good thing. So again, when we take you know, the Garcia example, we think this example, bring some emotions into it. Bring, bring, get, get to the heart of the matter and get people to understand how serious this is. Lastly, the program needs to be resilient. So this is something that's coming up a lot more often in our, in our industry, which I'm really glad about. And in my practice, I really want to get people to start thinking about cyber resiliency. Anybody remember the John Chambers quote? when he was with Cisco, it's not if, but when, when it comes to a cyber attack, and how angry people got from that, because they're like, oh, you're just trying to sell me more ASAs, you're a jerk, and all like that. And it was a little provocative back then, 10 years ago, because it wasn't, you know, a lot of these things weren't prevalent. But it's now out of our control of whether we get attacked or not. I, just today, just today, University of Rochester experienced, uh, announced that they experienced a, a data incident, we're gonna call it incident. Breach is a legal word, not a technical word, so we don't say breach, we say it's an incident, it's an incident at this point. But their incident took place because of a third party software vulnerability. How do, how, do how do you keep up with that? I don't care how big your team is, I don't care how big your tool set is, how do you keep up with that? The, the, the information bulletin that came out for Windows last week, talked about how China is now infiltrated into our telecoms and into our critical, critical grid, grid systems. 
people say, well, you know, we're doing what we can and we're okay and everything like that and we're not worried, they don't want us. It's like, okay, well, if you are an organization that relies on internet, phone, and electricity, and that comes down, you don't have control over that. You do not have control over that. That's just going to come down and you're going to be in trouble because someone from a cyber perspective has indirectly impacted your organization. So this thought of resiliency and... Oh, we're moving quick, so I'm going to play this real quick. So this is in 2005, Hurricane Katrina. And um, I got this fact checked by someone that was actually involved in FEMA from that, so this is not a, you know, a stretch. You could fact check me on this one. But this is the levy. This is the levy that worked. And as you can see, this, the water is just streaming and pouring into neighborhoods by the millions of gallons. And so what they're doing here right now is they drop this inflatable type thing here. And you can start to see it rising from underneath. And there it is, and it's stopping it. And now we have a patchwork situation in place until we can get something in where a little bit more fortified. So think about it from this perspective. New Orleans knew the risk that they had already. Like, it's, it's not like, oh, a hurricane's coming. We never thought that a hurricane would hit here. The preparation for Katrina was massive. The efforts were massive. There were evacuation plans. There were storm windows growing up. There were, you know, they used the Superdome. They had the National Guard on, 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 on standby. Hurricane hits. No one accounted for the levees breaking. No one accounted for the levees breaking. When the levees broke, it destroyed neighborhoods to become unrecognizable. From a security perspective, what happens when our levees break? What are we going to do? What are we going to do when we have a rack full of the high-tech, Gartner top right corner, they took me to a steak dinner and a Bills game and I love them so much, and that fails us. And that goes through. Then what do we do? What do we do in that situation? We need to build resiliency into our programs. We need to say, okay, not if, but when something happens, how do we get that 38-day incident that took place down to 12 days? And how do we not lose three, three of our biggest customers, but even one of our biggest customers, so that we can be resilient? How, how can we survive the, the, the catastrophic impact of an incident? Has anybody been involved in an incident? Well, it's a, it's a weird question because then people are like, well, I can't legally say it, but, you know, give me the wink of the eye or something like that. But I think a majority of us have seen what an incident looks like. It, it's horrible. I have seen network engineers sleeping in cops in data centers. I have seen people lose time with family. I, I had a CIO that had... Um, her daughter's senior soccer banquet that she had to, that she wanted to go to. The kid played soccer from three through senior year of high school. She had to miss it because she had to be on a call with DHS and and um, and a couple other three letters to talk about what had, had taken place. So either you do that or you go, you know, you're you're in trouble. Like I don't know if it's jail or or something, but she had to be there. She had to miss her daughter's senior banquet. And so when we build our plans and we decide on the tools that we're buying, we need to have that in mind of, okay, if something, God forbid, or when something, God forbid, happens, how quickly can I get up? How quickly can I, can I stem the tide? How quickly can I stop the bleeding to make sure that we are generating revenue as quick as possible? If it's healthcare, we're making sure that our patients are healthy. We had a great conversation about that today of, of how healthcare is, how it's double jeopardy in healthcare, because not only do you have the stress of keeping a network that's in total flux, going and, and secure, but then you have patient safety. Anybody remember ECMC from 2016? So the big concern there was they're a tier one hospital. So there was actually thoughts and concern around the fact that is this a terrorist attack where they've knocked us out and then someone crashes a plane or someone takes an 18-wheeler and has a major wreck on 90 and we have nowhere to treat people, like legitimately can't take care of people. And so, again, the resilient piece of it is, is of major importance. So as I promised, talk about how, how we build it. How do we build the program out? How do we go back to our organizations 
or how do we go back today or Monday and set our adjustments and say, okay, we need to have a plan in place. We need to have a program in place that has our company culture that's built inside of it. And we have the, in, we have the thoughts and minds of our employees, the thoughts and minds of our clients, our vendors, and things like that. First thing is know your business. Don't you hate when someone comes up here and they're like, did you hear about the target breach? I hate when people do that. Because who's a major retailer? It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. I've, been, I've sat in meetings before in healthcare. I've sat in meetings before in finance. I've sat in meetings before in K through 12. And the vendor brings up the target breach. It's the dumbest thing. It's a retail environment. That doesn't hit home. We have to know our business. We have to know our business. First question I ask people when I talk to them. This is the most sophisticated cybersecurity question I can ask. How do you make money? Start there. How do you make money, and how do you and and how do you, and how are you connected, and how are you protecting yourself from that from that connectivity? So if you're in K through 12, know the risk through K through 12. That's children. If you're in healthcare, know the risk of uh, know the risk in your business. Patient health. Then you need to assess the risk. And so when I say an assessment, I'm not saying run a NASA scan on your environment and that's your assessment. I'm talking about a holistic business risk assessment for your environment. This is something that you can run internally. This is something that you can third party out. But a NASA scan is not going to pick up on the weakness of your policies and procedures. A NASA scan is not going to test the metal of your employees and how they're keeping you safe. You want to get a full assessment, a full 360 assessment of the business and understand exactly what the risks are holistically. So in that, in that meeting, we want HR in there. We want sales in there. We want marketing in there. We want operations in there. We want everybody in there because everybody holds a piece of risk. We talk about data security, and this, this was some guy that I used to work with. And he used to say, okay, who's in charge of data security here? And we'd have a whole table of people sitting around, and they say, well, it's a CISO's job, or it's a DPO's job, or, you know, it's, it's you know, it's like, no, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you. Our employees all are in charge of the data. So we got to include them in on this assessment. And then decide what to do with the risk. Risk is awesome because no vendor, myself, anybody can say what you do with the risk. Yeah, you want to mitigate as much risk as you possibly can, but you can assume some risk. Some risk maybe is out of, is out of bounds to, to, to take care of. I've worked with so many manufacturing organizations that have their mission critical machinery on their on their shop floor pre XP. You have two choices. Either either you, you leave it as is and you know that there's risk and you, you come up with a plan to mitigate as quick, quick as possible, or you load a tool in there, it explodes, business shut down, you can't operate anymore. So when you get the risk assessment done, then you have a logical conversation with the business and saying, okay, we can't afford to, do, to take care of this risk now, but at least we know about it. The worst thing and where a lot of trip-offs happen in incident response is the element of surprise. It's the, it's the ambush. It's the element of surprise. It, why do you think a lot of these things happen at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning? They want to shock you. Like, it's not, you know, 1 o'clock on a Monday afternoon when it's fully staffed and everybody's there and everybody's... It's 2 o'clock in the morning. They want, they want to catch the element of surprise. So having a solid program, having an incident response plan in place, that will help you to know what's going on. And then the risk that could have been exploited, at least it's not a surprise. And at least you have some sort of plan around it. And then you build a business plan of action and milestones. So I've kind of dumped on tools a little bit, and I want to stay, take a step back here. Tools are important. Tools are very important. But when you build your plan of action and milestones, it shouldn't be, well, we gotta buy XDR, we gotta buy SOAR, we gotta buy a firewall, we gotta buy something to bake bread, like whatever. They all do the things. And I see a lot of organizations take that path. Like, hey, what's your cybersecurity strategy? Well, we got funding, and we're gonna buy all these tools. The business plan of action could be actually no cost to the organization to take care of some stuff. Hey, we need to do policies and procedures. You can outsource that, sure. But if you put HR, security, and operations in a room, you might be able to bang out policies and procedures pretty quickly. 
I'm going to give you a little cheat code. Chat GPT. Very interesting. I put in chat GPT, I am a 250 person manufacturing organization that has to adhere to government standards. Please help me write an incident, a, a written information security plan. It got me 80% of the way there. It's pretty interesting. So it's not 100%, but it got me 80% of the way there. And so when you build these plans of, and act, of actions and milestones, it doesn't necessarily cost you a fortune to do. And it, it will itemize what you need to do from most important to least important. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I can knock out 10 through 7 really quickly, really cheaply, let me go after that. But if you do that and you leave one at the top open as your biggest threat and vulnerability, you're in trouble. Like I talk to people all the time. It's like, well, I'm going to do a pen test. Okay, great. Why are you going to do a pen test? Well, because we do one every year, we have to check the box, and we need to show that we've done something. Like, okay. Where does pen testing stand in your cybersecurity risk strategy? What's a cybersecurity risk strategy? That's a question they ask. So I'm actually helping them save money to say, hey, maybe that's not number one. Maybe number one is an incident response plan. That's something that you can do with effort, but something that's not going to break the bank, and that's going to get you closer to where you want to be from a cybersecurity perspective. Get the organizational wide buy-in. Again, as I said, I hate when people say people are our biggest weakness in cybersecurity. It's, it doesn't sit well with me. I, I know it sits well with some people. I don't die on many hills. I kind of die on this hill because it, it, just, it just demoralizes people. It's like, oh, I'm a schmuck. Okay, you know, whatever. And, you know, and, and it doesn't get people excited. It doesn't get people interested. It doesn't get people passionate about protecting the organization. You know, when the ECMC thing happened, I was in a meeting with some of the nurses, and the nurses were angry. And they weren't angry because they had to go back to pen and paper, but they were angry because they looked at these criminals as trying to kill their patients. And they were upset. They were mad. And they, they felt the passion. They felt, oh, we've been attacked. We've been attacked. And that's the kind of emotion you want to stir inside of your organizations. I'm going to protect my organization's assets because if I don't take the time to do that, that could cause harm for my fellow workers, that could cause harm for my family, that could ca cause harm for my career. So we want to get that organizational wide buy. One of the best, one of the best things I ever saw was I worked on a, on a project and the CEO emailed the CISO and the CISO emailed me. CEO was mad as an executive assistant because she's sending him phishing emails 50 times a day because she's just on high alert. Because she got it. She got it. She's like, I have to protect my CEO. I'm, I'm, I'm his guard dog. And so, you know, we pulled it back a little bit, but she got it. She got the whole thing. And then it's wash, rinse, and repeat. There is no end to cybersecurity. You will never be 100% secure. It's impossible. Your program will never be... 100% where it needs to be. Last year at this time at B-Sides, who was talking about ChatGPT? No one. No one. You say ChatGPT last year, it's like, what is that? Now it's the biggest thing. Now it's driving security professionals out of their minds because they're like, I don't know what to do. So do your policies and procedures and your plan of actions, do they now reflect how you're going to do this new thing that's out there? We need to make sure that we articulate to our businesses that this is never ending. And, and you know, again, executives and boards, there's a beginning and an end to a lot of different things. Like we have this project, beginning and end, we're gonna, we're gonna have an end to it. Cybersecurity and risk does not end. And the sooner that we are able to understand that, the easier things will be able to go. The more nimble we'll be, the more flexible we'll be, we'll be the more fluid we'll be. Because our adversaries, that's what they're doing. There's a B-Sides, and I'm not going to say a country because, God forbid, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but there's a B-Sides in some country right now where they're all around, and they're having business meetings, and they're having pipeline reviews of companies that they can get. They're, they're always on the move, 24 by 7, 365. Nation state organizations are motivated to take us down. And, and to make our lives miserable. That's what their motivation is. 
Common criminals are motivated by money. Some countries you can make 35 cents a day by bagging groceries or $35,000 a day by cracking into networks. I like to think that I'm a, a moral guy. That's real money. That's real money. And so we have to combat our adversaries with the same fervor, with the same precision um, in building the programs that we have. So that is it. Um, ten, minutes. ten minutes. Any questions, any thoughts? I, I have a question. Yes. What would you say about rolling disaster recovery into incident response and making the same plan address both situations? As yeah, a way I, of, of, of drive, you know, because a lot of the risk that you see in a disaster situation is the same type of risk that you would see if your internet's broken for a cybersecurity reason. So you might be able to help your business decide to work on the cyber side by also rolling that into the overall business plan of what do we do if the business is, you know, here we have winter storms. You know, a blizzard comes in and knocks out power to half the city. How do, how do you keep your business operation going during that time? You know, who do you call, what do you call, how do you do that? That could all be rolled into this just as an extension of it or a, a, a pre-portion of this. So that's a good point. So how I see it as a part of the business continu continuity plan, usually this is a different department that handles that. Maybe right. Legal. Legal, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so it technically all hands in hand, and it has to be a collaborative effort between... IR plan, yeah. um, the business continuity plan, and then the disaster recovery is usually a infrastructure team, right? The, yeah, but they're all, all they all have a lot of the same information. It's kind of an interlinked tree. Could, yeah. Could <coughs> you start with the with the top center there, assess risk. So when you do that, you're actually going to break that down because there are different systems that the organization already operates. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a payroll system, and there's a manufacturing ERP, let's say, and then there's a uh, a sales um, and a customer relationship management, whatever else there is. And each of those, you're going to do a process called business impact assessment. Mm -hmm. And you're going to look at each system and figure out, what does this mean to the business? What if I couldn't use this for a day or a week or a month? Would I be out of business? Would I be hurting but I could manage? Would it be like, that's inconvenient, but I'll keep on. So you, you do that BIA process for each system that the business operates, and then from that BIA descends three things, an incident response plan that covers each of those systems, and a disaster recovery plan that tells you how to recover those systems if you can't operate them the way you operate them now, which thank goodness for SAS because that takes a lot of that <laughs> off our plate. And finally, a business continuity plan that covers other maybe non-IT systems like we have an office, we have a storefront, we have a manufacturing facility. How do we keep operating if you know the National Guard shows up and says, floods come in, you gotta get out of here, and we can't literally can't go to it. I, I think because it, it, it's a fundamental debate that I've heard where they're like, well, keep the IRP separate from DCDR because we want to highlight cybersecurity. But I challenge that because I say if you roll it in with DCDR. Then the chance of the org then the chance the IR rolling it in with BC and DR, you have a better chance for the organization to rally around that that thing. Right. So we're that's putting a cyber attack on par with an earthquake. So if I have a business that's built on a San Andreas fault, and my business is worried about, oh my gosh, if this is a big one, we all sink, and then we all start, you know, La Brea season two. Um, <laughs> but if we can roll, if we can put it on par that situation with, hey, it's 2 a.m., we've just got our backups blown up, we just got production knocked down, we're not operational, and the clock is ticking for us not to shut our business down. I think we, I think you can kind of sli sli slide it in there and put it on par with it, and then, and then you get it from that perspective. I think when you separate it, then it's, a, it, it's all mental. There's a yes. lot of mental gymnastics that we're doing in risk and cybersecurity. So if it's separate, I feel that it's, it's kind of still on its own island. It's kind of just, well, this is like, you know, sneakers or Project X, and maybe it'll happen. If, to your point earlier, you were saying, well, can we figure out a way to make this comprehensible 
to the people who would make the big decisions, everyone can understand what would happen in a big Katrina or an earthquake. Yeah, yes, yes. So if, that, that's your in right there. Yes. If, if we're down, it doesn't matter why we're down, but now what? Yes. You know? If your organization has a function called risk management, it wasn't put there by IT or the CIO or the CISO. It was put there by the CEO and the COO and the CFO, the big three. And they pay attention to that function. So if cybersecurity risk becomes one of the risks that risk management is also attuned to, then you will have automatically the attention of the C-suite. You know, I, I've noticed um, in, in my organization, I've done tabletop exercises, right? BC, DR, and IRP tabletop exercises. And one of the findings that, that I've seen is in organizations where there's a risk management office, um, the IRP, there's players from every part of the business there. But when the tabletop exercises for IRP occur, or when they're, they attempt to occur, we stand in front of this to convince them not to do this, but if there's no risk management office, what I found more often than not is the room is filled with technology people, exactly. and mm -hmm. no one knows how to how to handle a PR issue of ransomware leveling the business. No one knows how to handle the legal issues. No one knows how to handle yeah. sensitive data getting out. So yeah, that was a, that's a really good call out. So whether there's potential consolidation of those or not, if that's an opportunity, but I, I, I think the, the, the game changer I've seen is in the yeah. organizations where there's a risk management. Oh, so yes, sir. Yeah, so to piggyback on pretty much everything everyone said so far, just a little bit of here, there, and everywhere, um, one way I've seen really successful in the past is there's different types of incidents. So, I mean, everyone in this room is very acutely familiar with the cybersecurity incident. Now, let's say you have a you know, public-facing business, whether that's in healthcare, finance, running a bank, any, or storefronts, etc. There's also you know, physical security. There can be a physical security incident. Now, does cybersecurity necessarily need to sit in on the physical security meetings on how are they going to respond to an active shooter in the middle of a store? But all of that should feed into a overall business continuity disaster recovery incident response plan and the cybersecurity incident response can act as an input into the overall larger business, which then going to tabletops is very helpful. You get the cyber folks with the operational IT folks, you set them down, they run that part of the tabletop, then you know X number of days, months, weeks down the line, you have the big players sit down and go, hey, so the cyber incident people did this, here are their inputs into the injections for your guys' tabletop. Because again, necessarily, the CFO doesn't necessarily need to have a full understanding of exactly how they trace down the logs, but you know, hey, our, our estimated time to recovery is going to be three days from this, and stuff like that. So it's a cohesive system, but still needs to remain separate for the benefit of everyone. So Jeff, what you're saying is, so cyber insurance, when I pull my iron button and I load in, I load in an, an endpoint tool. Yeah. That's not a, that's not a uh, an IR plan to have. Okay. Just, I've just, seen some. I, I've never yeah. seen I've never seen yeah. a tool go through litigation in an IR that's right. situation. That's exactly right. To your to to your point and to your point, um, that's a thing. Rowan, that was a great it was a great thing to bring up because I actually learned something from that because I, I I've always struggled with that that line of delineation between the two. There's, I, I personally don't believe there should be that much delineation because a lot of the same pieces of information that you need to solve one is the same thing that you would use to solve the other. You know, the PR contacts, who, who is the voice of the company in a PR incident? It's going to be the same thing if there's a disaster at the location as it is going to be if it's an, um, a P, uh, a security threat incident. And I come at this from a slightly different angle. I come from my backgrounds in EMS. I have um, a lot of FEMA classes for incident response for uh, the drills that we used to do when I lived in Rochester, which is what happens if the Ghanai nuclear plant in uh, Webster has a major incident and they have to ship all of the kids from Wayne County into Erie County to protect them. And that's a disaster test that they do yearly, once for the feds and once for the state, alternating years. And so a lot of the things, the logistics that they look at for that massive move 
I have no idea if any of the businesses in that area know what they're going to do if that happens. But they're all still affected, and all of their kids are affected, and all of those parents are affected, because all those parents would have to come into Erie County to go to MCC in this case, to pick up their kids, because that's the busing destination. But I, I, don't, I don't know, since I've only been on the Erie County side of that, I don't know what they put out to the parents, what, you know, what is sent out for preparedness, and if like the rest of the businesses even make a plan around that level of disaster. But it, it could all be the same type of disaster. Well, I apologize. I said 30 minutes. Oh, yeah. I just would like to say that that line is already getting blurred. Um, I've been through audits where in the past it was a simple question. Do you have good backups? Right. Yes. That used to be. Now they're going, when's the last time you verified your backups? <laughs> you know, mm. does everyone know, you know, where your DR plan is stored? Mm. When's the last time you did a walkthrough? When's the last time you did an actual exercise? Right. So it's it's getting blurred. So normally when you sit down with the auditor and talk about the security configuration of the system, things like that, they're starting to ask about both the BC and DR aspects of it. Um, have you considered how much you can actually cut back and be able to limp along for BC? Or what if you're hard down, how quickly can you get back up? So you know, the auditors are starting to look at that in the same breath that they're looking at the system security. Yeah, I'm sorry. I said 30 minutes. We we went to the top, but that was an awesome discussion. Thank you so much for participating. I really hope you got some good value. Thank you. Thank you. My goal, my goal for this one is everybody gets some value out of it, where you can make where you work, or if you're a student, you know, start thinking about these things if you're a student. If, if there's a place that you work at, make something that you can bring a value to make the organization a little bit more secure and, and risk tolerant these days. So thank you so much. I'm humbled by your attendance and uh, enjoy the weather.